chapter number 12, brother. Exercise in the heat as well as the cold and just different responses of exercise uh, or just the body's responses in the heat and the cold and also a little bit of humidity stuff in there as well, which is very, very important. Now, I'm not going to do too much of an intro to this. I'm going to do a little bit of an outro. There's a couple of things I want to discuss, talk about a couple, maybe a little bit of a rant, maybe. But this is the second time that I've recorded this because, well, actually, it's the first time I've recorded it. The first time I went through the whole thing and forgot to press record. So I'm going to keep this fairly short for y'all and enjoy the chapter. Chapter number 12, exercise in hot and cold environments. This is something that I have studied at least a little bit in the past, uh, or at least helped out with some studies in graduate school. This is one of my favorite chapters, the environmental stuff. Uh, definitely something that I enjoy learning about still and also teaching. So let's get on with this. Okay, so let's look at the body temperature regulation first. First off, if we have some sort of environmental condition that is above and beyond what we would refer to as normal environment, so it's uh, hot, it's really cold, it's really humid, our bodies are going to go through uh, some changes in response to that, and we could have some trouble, if, especially if we are not adapted to it, if we're in maybe poor condition to begin with. But if we add some sort of physical exertion to that, then we're going to have even more problems. We're going to have more thermoregulatory responses. Now, it's not all bad as long as we are adapted to it and the human body can respond very well to a lot of these different conditions as well as physical performance or physical exertion, excuse me. However, it can throw the body off at least a little bit. Now, after a certain period of time, and that's going to vary depending upon what the situation is, our bodies will get used to it, will adapt to it. Now, there's two different terms that can be used for this adaptation in some sort of environmental condition, and that would be acclimation and acclimatization. Now, these two terms have different meanings for the most part. However, they are used interchangeably quite often, so they're not exactly the same, but it's one of those situations where we use them quite often for each other. So take that how you may. The best definition I can give for these is acclimation is more of a short-term adaptation, and it's usually in a simulated climate. So for instance, if you go into a room that is really hot, you're going to get used to that somewhat. Anyway, you're going to get fairly comfortable with it and get used to the warmth in that room as long as it doesn't keep increasing, especially if there's a lot of people in that room. But your body will get used to it uh, for that hour, maybe two, three hours that you're in that room. But it's not really a long-term adaptation. It's kind of more of a response. But the major point here is that it's a simulated environment. It's a simulated climate. It's man-made. On the other hand, acclimatization usually refers to those long-term adaptations that are occurring in a real environment that that's, that's kind of weird to say a real environment but because uh, every environment is real i guess um but i digress so this is an actual environment you're actually outside you're at altitude you're in a very hot and humid place uh the sun is sun is shining or maybe it is maybe fairly cold however we maybe have some problems acclimatizing to the cold which we'll get into here in a little bit but those are the two terms that are often described as some sort of adaptation to environment, especially extreme environmental conditions. Now, our bodies are what we refer to as hemiotherms. So we are generating heat from the inside. Now, we can get heat from the outside also to warm our bodies up. However, a lot of the heat that is created is inside the body and it's trying to get out. It's trying to dissipate some of it. And we're trying to thermoregulate, trying to maintain that 98.6 degrees plus or minus, you know, a few tenths or whatever it may be. But we're trying to keep the body at a core temperature that is good for metabolism and all the other processes that need to occur inside of the body. Now, when we look at ATP production, roughly a quarter of it is actually used for work. And then a lot is dissipated as heat. So our bodies warm up. And that's why when we start moving around, our bodies become a little bit warmer. And as long as we're alive, 
our bodies are heated. We, we have some physiological responses inside of our bodies. We have uh, chemical reactions that are occurring that are causing that heat to increase. That heat then moves from the core inside of the body out to the skin via the blood. Then from there, we may be able to dissipate that a couple different ways. One of them is going to be more prominent than the other ones listed here. So the ones that we have are radiation, conduction, convection, and evaporation. We'll get into those in a minute here. But if we look over here at the scale, and if you're listening to this on your iPod, <laughs> I don't know if iPods are even around anymore. I don't know. Um, I might be living in the 2000s again. But if you're listening on your phone or wherever it may be, uh, just to the audio, there's a picture here of a scale, kind of one of those old timey scales, like the coin and gold scales. And on one side, we have these four ways of heat loss, radiation, conduction, convection, and then evaporation. So that's the heat loss side. And then we have the heat gain side, and that's the metabolic heat, and then any environmental heat that we are gaining from the environment. So, and that's through conduction, convection, and radiation. Again, we'll see these here in a second here, go over the definitions of them. But we want to try to maintain a balance between these and try to thermoregulate the body so it doesn't get too hot, but also not too cold either. Okay, let's go into the definitions of these conduction, convection, radiation, and evaporation. Conduction is dry heat exchange, as well as convection and radiation. But conduction is actual molecule-to-molecule -molecule contact. It's a solid object touching something else. So if you touch your hand to a cold object, it feels cold because your hand is actually warmer than that object. And now you are going to transfer some of that heat to that object. Then the object will warm up. Your hand will get cooler. So you're just transferring energy. You're transferring heat to that piece of material, whatever it may be. It could be, uh, could be a wall, could be a hot piece of, or a cold piece of metal, excuse me. But that could also, having said that, if that pot that you touched that was on the stove, if it was hot, well, it feels hot because your hand is much colder than the pot. So the heat is going to be transferred from the pot to your skin, and you're going to feel that then. Convection is also, again, a dry heat exchange. And this is going to involve motion of gases or liquids to heat a surface. So any type of wind or air movement is what's going to be causing the heat exchange in this case. And a convection oven works just like this. The air inside of that oven is heated and it's going to heat the food inside of the pan. Whatever pan that may be, maybe a good piece of nice big pan of lasagna, potentially. Lasagna is probably my favorite food. And that's why I mentioned that. And my wife just made it a couple of days ago. So it's kind of still on my mind. And then radiation. This is also, again, another dry heat exchange. This is infrared radiation. This is the main way that we're going to gain heat from the environment. And most of that's going to be coming from the sun. This radiation can also go outward from the body as well. In fact, if you're in a room of a lot of different people, which you shouldn't be right now because of COVID, but if you're in a room full of a lot of different people and you're all packed into that small room and the room heats up, well, a lot of that heat gain in that room that you're feeling is because of the radiation coming off of each of their bodies. Now, the main thermoregulation of the body is going to be evaporation, and this is via the sweat. So the fluid is going to evaporate off the skin, and then that heat loss is going to be transferred from the skin to the environment there. Now, this has one little caveat to it, though, is that the outside environment has to have less humidity than the skin. So if it's really humid out, that transfer of heat is going to be less and less because it's not going to evaporate nearly as quickly. All right, let's go into a practical example. We have a football player here, if you're listening, and this picture is just showing the different ways that we can either gain heat or that we can dissipate some of this heat. So first off, we have the sun, and this is the solar and diffused radiation coming in to the body. So the sun is hitting us, 
And then it's also reflecting off of any surfaces as well. It could be other players. It could be mostly the, the turf actually is where a lot of this is going to be reflected off of, but it could also be directly from the sun as well. Now there's going to be a little bit of conduction from the shoes on the surface, whatever surface the player is touching. If it's the old style AstroTurf that got super, super hot, that can go up to uh, well over 100 degrees, even on like maybe an 80 degree day, because that stuff would just soak up the sun's heat and radiation. Some of the newer turf, the field turf has actually gotten a lot better. In fact, some of the pellets, the rubber pellets in the turf, Sometimes they've actually tried to experiment with different colors of those, like white, so that it can uh, maybe not uh, get so hot to where it is almost melting or at least melting some of the shoes. Because there are instances where that turf can get so hot where the glue inside of the spikes is actually coming, starting to melt a little bit and the soles of the shoes and the spikes are actually starting to fall off. So that's obviously a dangerous situation there. So we want to try to keep that as cool as possible, but the sun is going to do what it's going to do. So any way that we can try to uh, minimize that heat on the surface that we're touching is going to be good. But that is one way of heat gain from the environment. Now we also have convection here as the player is running. They are creating a current over top of their skin, and that's causing some convective heat loss. But also if the wind is blowing, the same thing is going to be happening as well. And then this player is likely going to be sweating. That sweat is going to be transferred to the environment. It's going to be evaporated. And that heat loss then is going to go outside to the environment. Now, there's one other one here that we don't normally talk about too much in humans, but it does occur. And that's the respiratory heat loss. We do lose a little bit of heat through our mouths and through breathing. Canines do this much better than we do. In fact, that's their main thermoregulatory system is through respiratory heat exchange. But we have it a little bit. We exchange a little bit of heat through the mouth, but not a whole lot. So I mentioned humidity and sweat. And we have a concept known as water vapor pressure. And the relative humidity is key into determining and the relative humidity is key in determining how great this heat loss can actually be. So we need that vapor pressure gradient. The humidity needs to be lower than it is on the skin. Now, if the skin is saturated with water or sweat, then it's 100% saturated. It needs to be less than that. But the closer it gets to 100%, the more difficult it's going to be to evaporate that sweat. So once we get to 100%, there's a massive decrease in evaporation. When there is a lower humidity, especially in a really dry climate, a lot of times in the desert, people will become dehydrated, not only because it's hot, but because they're sweating, but it evaporates so quickly in that they don't realize that they're sweating. Another area that this occurs too, and this goes to the 100% humidity, is people who are in water. So swimmers, a lot of times, can get dehydrated Although they're surrounded by water the entire time, or as long as they're in the pool, obviously, but they don't realize that they're sweating, so they're not drinking enough water because they're not reacting to that sweat. Like somebody who is outside of a pool or a 100% humidity environment, which is what a pool would be. So we need that vapor pressure gradient to be able to exchange that heat through sweat. Now, when we're exercising in the heat, we have some effects on the cardiovascular system. And this should be somewhat obvious because we're losing sweat. That sweat is coming from the cardiovascular system. It's coming from the blood itself. So it's the plasma within the blood. So what's happening here is we have the skin arterioles that are dilating. And this helps for convective heat loss, but also helps to redirect blood flow from the non-working tissues as well. But the other thing that happens is that the blood goes to the skin so that we can release the plasma. So the blood volume will decrease because we're taking some of the blood volume away via sweat. Therefore, we have less blood going back to the heart. So the stroke volume will decrease. This causes an increase in heart rate. The reason for that is that we need to maintain cardiac output because we have not decreased our intensity. So we still need the same amount of blood volume per minute 
But because we have a decrease in stroke volume, our heart rate must increase to make up for that decrease in stroke volume so that we can get out the same amount of cardiac output to those working tissues. Now, some of the limitations, uh, there's a decreased performance due to the demand of thermal regulation. Exercise in the heat is going to cause a decrease in performance. It doesn't matter who it is, even if they are adapted to that environment. The problem is, is the heat. We're losing sweat. We're losing blood volume. It doesn't matter how in shape somebody is. If they're exercising in 90 degree temperatures, they're going to perform worse than they would if it was 50 degrees. So there is a risk of overheating, and this is for everybody. Now, people who are deconditioned, not in very good cardiovascular health, or who are not acclimatized to that environment are going to have a little bit more of a risk. Okay, let's talk about some parameters here that are going to be changing during exercise in the heat. Now, if you're listening, uh, we have four graphs here. One is rectal temperature, and that is one of the most accurate ways of actually getting core temperature, stroke volume, heart rate, and cardiac output. And we have two different temperatures here that somebody was exercising at. One was 78 degrees Fahrenheit, and one was 110 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot, 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 hot. So rectal temperature was obviously increased during the 110 degree heat, but stroke volume was decreased significantly. And this was because they were sweating much more than they were at the 78 degrees. Now here's the kicker. Heart rate was increased. And this is what I was going back to. There is very little change in cardiac output except once we get to higher and higher intensities, there's a little bit of a decrease in cardiac output. But to maintain that cardiac output for a certain period of time, we need to increase heart rate because we have this huge deficit in stroke volume because of the lack of blood volume now. So this is known as cardiovascular drift. If this continues... There are some problems that can occur. In fact, there are conditions that have been named because of some health problems in the heat. Heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. So the heat cramps are occurring mostly because there's some sodium loss, because not only with the water loss, we're also losing some electrolytes. This can cause some really painful cramping, especially in the large muscles, mostly in the ones that we're using at that period of time. A lot of times in the hamstrings, the quads, the calves. But this can all be prevented by proper hydration, as well as intake of electrolytes. There is a whole industry that has made billions of dollars because of this concept. Sports drinks are designed to do this, to prevent this from happening. You get the water, but also you get the electrolytes along with it. You can do the same thing by drinking pickles or <laughs> drinking pickles. <laughs> I don't know. You probably shouldn't be drinking pickles. You should be drinking pickle juice if you can stomach that. That's kind of the problem there. Uh, you can kind of get away with sucking on oranges and maybe eating uh, some fruits and stuff like that, maybe at halftime, uh, whatever it may be. But Gatorade, Powerade, those types of drinks, they're designed to rehydrate, but also give you the electrolytes that you may have lost. Now, if that continues... That dehydration continues. We get heat exhaustion, and this is starting to get into dangerous territory. This individual is going to start to feel fatigued, very dizzy, nauseated, possibly vomiting, and sometimes that vomiting might just be dry heaving because they don't have anything in their stomach. They could faint, and there's going to be a rapid pulse. I mean, a fairly rapid pulse, and that is the ex extension, essentially, of the cardiovascular drift where they've lost so much blood volume, their heart rate is increasing exponentially. So the body here just cannot meet the demands of the muscles and the skin blood flow that it needs. If it continues even further, what can happen is very severe. This is failure of thermoregulatory mechanism, which is known as heat stroke. This is when the core temperature goes above 104 degrees Fahrenheit. These individuals can be very confused, disoriented. They're going to potentially lose consciousness. They could go into a coma or even death. The brain is going to suffer at that point. The brain is even overheating 
at that point as well. And there's lack of blood flow and nutrients to those tissues, to the core and to the brain. But again, this can all be prevented by proper hydration and intake of electrolytes if they're lost. This is where I want to get into maybe a little bit of a rant uh, later on here about hydration and earning, quote unquote, earning your water and what it used to be like in athletics. So we have a figure here that is looking at rectal temperature versus running time. And this was two hours in length. Essentially what it shows is that with fluid intake, you can minimize the increase in rectal temperature, which is the core temperature versus trying to do it without drinking fluids. There was a huge increase in core temperature with not drinking fluids over those two hours of running time. In fact, it got above 40 degrees Celsius, which is well above, as I think it's about 100 and, well, this probably would have been about 101, 102 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a huge increase in core temperature. It's starting to become a little bit dangerous at that point. So drinking fluids can help minimize the increase in core temperature. The core temperature is going to increase regardless. We're exercising. We have a lot of metabolic processes that are happening but we can minimize some of that by actually drinking some fluids. Okay, acclimatization or acclimation to exercise in the heat. Some processes that our bodies will go through to try to acclimatize to a hot environment. And these same things are actually going to occur just by cardiovascular training, whether it's in the heat or not. Because when we start cardiovascular training, aerobic training, we're essentially creating a hot environment inside of our bodies. It's the same stuff that's going to be going on as if we were put into a hot environment. So we have a large plasma volume increase, and this helps to increase stroke volume so that we can maintain a fairly decent heart rate. We don't have to jump up the heart rate too much. Now, what does return to normal after about a week, but there's some other adaptations that are going to be occurring that are going to help with the blood flow. There was also a decrease in heart rate at a given intensity in that environment. There's going to be a slight increase in cardiac output. This helps to increase skin blood flow. And one of the key features of this is that we start to sweat earlier on. And also the sweat is more dilute, meaning that we don't have as much electrolyte loss. But at the same time, we have more sweat to evaporate, which means we can cool the body quicker than we did before we were exposed to that heat, that initial workout. And we have a couple different graphs here looking at rectal temperature and exercise time. These were about an hour and a half long exercise. And we have the differences between unacclimated individual and an acclimated individual. And the core temperature was lower after they were acclimated. And the heart rate was also lower at a given exercise time, which would be an exercise intensity as well. So the response for core temperature is improved as well as the heart rate response is improved at any given intensity after acclimation. So how long does the acclimation actually take? Well, we have a few different figures here looking at rectal temperature, hourly sweat rate, as well as the final heart rate for that intensity. All right, how long does that actually take? Eh, about a week and a half, about. Depending upon the individual, if they're already trained, aerobically, more than likely that it's only going to take maybe about a week, but it can take up to a week and a half, potentially two weeks, depending upon the individual. But usually within a week, week and a half, you will be adapted to exercising in that particular environment, that hot environment. Now, if that environment changes, if it is 80 degrees when you were acclimated, and now the average temperature throughout that next week is 90 or 95, your body is going to have to adapt to a new temperature. Now, you're going to have a better adaptation, might be a little bit shorter because you were already adapted previously to a hot environment, but you still need to adapt to a new one. And it doesn't take very long to lose this either. Usually within a week, less than a week, it is gone. Okay, we're going to switch gears here and talk about exercise in cold environments. Now, I have a few different pictures up here on the screen, and a couple of them actually look a little familiar to you, potentially, anyway. And they are the core temp pills in the little receiver that I was using in lab. And basically, these pills are swallowed. 
They have some electronics in them. They're able to transmit a signal out to this little device and are able to get a fairly accurate core temperature. In fact, these pills have been validated pretty well for research purposes. They're really handy because they are mobile. You can take them pretty much anywhere. You can take this little device almost anywhere versus the other one that I have up on the screen. And it just looks like a normal, almost looks like a charger cord for an iPhone or phone or whatever device you're using. But it is, in fact, a rectal thermometer. Now, most of the time we think of thermometers as very rigid, but the rectal thermometers, most of them, especially the ones that are used in exercise research, are flexible for obvious reasons. Because if they're exercising, they need to be somewhat flexible while they're in there because these individuals are going to be moving around and they could also be sitting. And a lot of times they're sitting on a bike and a bike seat is not very big. So there's a lot of pressure in one certain area of the body and that device needs to be somewhat flexible so that it doesn't cause any uh, discomfort or any more discomfort than there already is. But I'll go on a little bit of a rant here and say that I know that there is a little bit of a social faux pas with the rectal temperature and rectal thermometers, but it is not that bad. Trust me. Trust me on this. I'll talk about it here later. Okay, so who needs to worry about cold exposure and being physically active in the cold? Pretty much anybody. Hikers, uh, hunters. I go through it a lot during hunting season. In fact, hunters, and I'm no different, spend a lot of money <laughs> on clothes that help to keep them warm for long periods of time while they're just sitting there. Or clothes that help keep them warm but also help dissipate some of the sweat if they're hiking, if they're being active, going up and down mountains, uh, if they're walking uh, you know, through the brush, whatever it might be. Anybody who's working outside, as well as athletes. And again, everybody kind of needs to be aware of it. Clothing is going to be a big factor in cold exposure. And we'll get into some of that here in a second. One key piece of information, however, is that cold injuries are actually less common than heat injuries. However, a lot of people die from the cold injuries because they tend to be a little bit more severe and certainly more abrupt. And there are instances where somebody may be caught in a cold environment and they can't escape. So getting caught on a mountain in a blizzard, something like that. So they are just as important to prepare for. And they can be just as detrimental, if not worse, for either work or performance. Okay, let's talk about heat loss then in cold environments and body composition and its effects on heat loss. Being a little bit chubby actually helps you in this instance. An increase in subcutaneous fat helps to increase insulation. So that additional fat is helping to keep some of that heat in the body, especially around the core. Now, it's not to say that everyone should strive to have a little bit more extra and even more and more extra, but just saying that a little bit of subcutaneous fat does help. And this has been proven in multiple studies as well. With a decrease in body surface area to mass ratio, meaning that the mass of the individual is much greater than the surface area, meaning that they're just bigger, they're more stout, husky, whatever you want to put it. There's less of a heat loss that is occurring. So you're trapping some of that heat with that subcutaneous tissue. Now, when we look at men versus women, women tend to have a little bit more subcutaneous fat, which is actually an advantage, but they have less active muscle, which is a disadvantage. But... Also, and this kind of throws a little bit of something in the mix here, women tend to deal with the cold a little bit better because of the pain that can be involved with extreme cold. So it might potentially be a wash depending upon the individual and the environment. All right, physiological responses in the cold. The biggest one that we're going to have is what's known as shivering thermogenesis or what we usually refer to as just simply shivering. 
What actually happens here is the skin temperature cools rapidly. Therefore, our core temperature is going to start to fall. And we have this peripheral vasoconstriction. So in the skin and then also in the extremities. And we're trying to conserve that heat in the core. That's the important stuff. That's why our fingers and our toes get cold first. is because our bodies stop caring about those appendages. It wants to keep the core alive. And it wants to keep the brain alive as well. Those are the important things. We can live without fingers and toes, but we can't live without a fully functioning heart and also a brain. Well, some of us, I guess, maybe function without a brain. I think I do sometimes too. But I'm talking about in real world scenarios in real life here where we need to keep those things alive and not get them too cold or they will start to um, die off. The cells will start to die. So when we start to shiver, there's really no true mechanical work that's going on. There's contraction of the muscle fibers, but there's really no mechanical work that's happening. We're not doing bicep curls or jumping jacks or anything. We're just contracting the muscles. They're just simply twitching. So that energy then is converted into heat. And that's the reason that we are shivering is it's just the response of the body to try to warm itself up a little bit. And that vasoconstriction in those peripheral arteries, we're just trying to conserve body heat and try not to lose heat to the environment. And like I was saying before, with the increase in subcutaneous tissue, the heat loss is proportional or inversely proportional to fat mass. So as fat mass increases, heat loss will decrease. As fat mass decreases, heat loss will increase. So we need some insulation to help us with this, or at least having some insulation, subcutaneous fat is going to help us conserve some of that heat. We do actually have potentially what's known as non-shivering thermogenesis. However, this is maybe only seen in infants and probably not adults. So what this entails is there's an increase in metabolism in what's known as the brown adipose tissues. But that brown adipose tissue is really only seen in infants, and then we lose it as we get older. But young children potentially could have this, and the catecholamines, epinephrine, norepinephrine, could increase, and that increase is helping to elevate metabolism. So there's really heat production without... ATP generation. If we could do this, even as we get older and older, this would be amazing. Uh, even if it was maybe some sort of adaptation to occur, even just our regular adipocytes, but eh, not really occurring in adults, shivering is going to be the main response. Now, some other effects that can occur, if you've ever been in a really cold environment, you are going to know what I'm talking about. If your hands have ever been super, super cold, you can't hardly do a thing with your fingers. Any type of dexterity is gone. So it is a progressively diminishing function of your ability to do very fine dexterity skills, uh, picking up small objects, even opening up a bottle sometimes can just be sometimes even painful a little bit. Now, the main reason our hands get cold, well, the big reason is that the blood flow a lot of times is going away from the hands and that warm blood is going to the core. So we have this cold blood that is being trapped essentially in the hands. And if you look at our hands, there's a lot of different crevices there and we have a lot of surface area. That's a lot of space and a lot of area for convective heat loss. And that's why closing your hands, holding them together, maybe even having uh, mittens can help to decrease that heat loss, but it's still going to occur because there's still a lot of surface area on our hands to where heat loss can occur. Also, even though somebody may have sausages, if you will, for fingers, kind of uh, chubby fingers, there's still a lot of surface area and there's really not a lot of muscle mass as well as fat mass in the fingers. So there's still going to be little insulation. The heat generation is not going to be there as well. So we're going to have a lot of heat loss in the hands and that's why our hands get cold. But again, this can be painful at times and it just sometimes hurts to do those little wee skills with your hands and your fingers. So can we become acclimatized to the cold? 
Short answer. No, absolutely not. But that can get a little bit more complicated than that. The cold acclimatization, the studies are somewhat inconclusive. However, they lean a little bit more towards no. There are some instances where some individuals have shown possibly some adaptations, some acclimatization, and this is over months, even years of exposure to a certain environment. For instance, some fishermen, Alaska fishermen, have uh, actually had some what's known as intermittent vasodilation in the hands, meaning that some of that warm blood that is in the core will go to the hands every five, 10 minutes and move the cold blood from the hands to the core so that it can warm up. So you're switching this blood around every so often to keep the hands warm. And they're only seeing it in these individuals who have their hands in cold, icy water a good portion of the day. There's some other individuals that have been studied and they've shown possibly some adaptations to the cold. But again, it takes a long time for this to happen. Most of the adaptation that we see in humans is behavioral. So we put on better clothing, warmer clothing. We drink warm fluids, some little bit of hot cocoa, maybe some, <laughs> maybe some hot tea. We become physically active or we seek shelter. We start a fire. We have some sort of heat from the outside to warm our bodies up. We also, when we're really cold, we tend to eat a little bit more. And that's because of the thermic effect of food. Heats our bodies just a little bit from the inside. And some of the insulative properties of whatever clothing uh, could be a blanket, whatever it might be. So most of the adaptation is just habitual. So it's behavioral type of stuff that we go through. Now, the first condition that we'll talk about, whether it's an injury or not, is possibly up for debate, but it is a condition known as hypothermia. So this is low core body temperature. So this is when the body gets around 95, 96 degrees Fahrenheit is where this is going to be happening. This can occur in any season or any climate because if somebody is dunked in cold water, this can occur. Because water has a much, much greater heat exchange than air does. For instance, if you've ever sat in a sauna, say it was a uh, hundred 110 degrees Fahrenheit, you can probably survive. It probably doesn't feel that bad, right? But dunk your whole hand in 110 degree water. Sometimes that temperature in a sauna can get up to 140, 150 degrees. I believe there was one time I was in a sauna, I think it was 160, 170 degrees. I mean, it was blazing hot. But Try dunking your hand in 150 degree water sometime. Well, actually, don't do that. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. If you've ever done that, you know what it feels like. If you've ever accidentally uh, you know, spilled hot water or whatever it is on you, that heat exchange is much greater with the water than it is air. So it doesn't matter what climate it is, what season it is, if somebody is wet and there's air blowing over top of them, they can cool down very, very rapidly. Now, once the core body temperature gets below 31 degrees Celsius, so roughly 90-ish degrees, maybe like 92 degrees, shivering actually stops. And there's starting to be a progressive loss in functioning of the voluntary skeletal muscles after that point. Then once we get to about 20 degrees Celsius, there is loss of cardiac functioning. And the person at least goes into a coma, if not, dies. Now, if someone is hypothermic, the best way to rewarm them is just get them warm. Sleeping bag, any clothing, any type of radiant heat, a fire, and also warm fluids. All right, if you are listening, you uh, don't have the pleasure of looking at what probably one of the, um, I guess, somewhat disturbing pictures that, that I show in this class, but it is a picture of frostbite. This individual had frostbite on his toes and quite a few of his toes are black. Uh, one was amputated 
And there's also a lot of reddishness and kind of blistering to these. What occurs in frostbite, and this is probably the uh, the most severe cold injury. There's a couple other ones, chill blame, uh, that I'm not going to go into. And trench foot is another one. You can look those up. But frostbite is certainly the most severe. And this is because there's a low air temperature plus a very low amount of blood flow to those tissues. So frostbite usually occurs either in the toes, can occur in the fingers, and also maybe even on the nose or the ears. Because these are the extremities in which blood flow is going to be restricted. And if there is no clothing or no protectiveness over top of that part of the body, then it's going to cause even more problems. So there's lack of blood flow, low air temperature, and then also there's low oxygen to these tissues. So the entire skin and the blood vessels become damaged. Everything becomes damaged and they can also go down into the bone as well. So we have these black masses that form, and this is essentially a mummification or gangrene of these tissues. And this occurs in the muscles and the bones as well. Now, somebody who has frostbite, the best thing to do is clothing, warm liquids, warm water immersion is also important. However, trying to make sure that it's not too hot because you don't want risk of burns either from this individual. Now, it's going to be extremely painful possibly for them, um, but uh, it's kind of just part of it. Um, more than likely, those tissues are dead. They're either going to have to be amputated. Um, there's really no way of bringing them back because they're usually dead at that point, uh, and they could cause start to cause some other problems. Okay, that was chapter number 12. Had two parts there, exercise in the hot and as well, as well as the cold environments and exposure to those environments and the differences uh, between the responses and adaptations. And if you are watching it, I will see you in a minute. If you are listening, you're going to hear me in a minute and I will sum up the chapters a little bit. Okay, that was chapter number 12. And we went into, what, well, what, what did we even talk about in this chapter? Well, we talked about, well, at least I talked about, I was talking to my computer, <laughs> basically. Ah, uh, we went into the differences um, between acclimation, acclimatization, not really much of a difference. There's a subtle difference there, but those two terms are used interchangeably. And if you notice, I actually use them interchangeably throughout the lecture. Also, definitions and discussions around conduction, convection, radiation, and evaporation, and evaporation being the major thermoregulatory response in the body, and that would be the sweat. Now, having said that with the sweat, a couple of different things I want to talk about. First is, I really, really hope that we have gotten past something that used to be fairly common in athletics. And I think back to uh, football, uh, and this is where a lot of times it'll, it'll pop up. It'll pop up in some other sports as well. But in football, say you had two a days and those two a days were in August, sometimes late July, but in August, it don't matter what part of the country you're in. In August, it's hot and it's likely humid as well, especially in the Northeast, uh, different parts of the South, it's going to be hot and humid. So those athletes are going through four or five hours of exercise per day, possibly even six hours per day. And so they're wearing pads also football pads. So the, the helmets also, they're not dissipating a lot of heat in those areas and those pads, especially the shoulder pads, they're around the core. So the core is being fairly overheated because of the exercise and because of the radiation from the sun, but also you're not able to dissipate a lot of that heat because the sweat is just kind of sitting there. It's not able to evaporate all that much. There's a little bit of convective heat loss. If you get some airflow into the pads, but not a whole lot. So they're sweating and they just continue to sweat and their body continues to sweat and they lose a lot of blood volume. They lose a lot of water. And for some reason, for years, the coaches would 
tell the athletes, oh no, you need to earn your water. You can't go get drink water. I don't care how you feel. You need to earn your water. You toughen up like a man. Just, <sighs> that is hopefully something we have gotten past. We have multiple, multiple studies on the effects of it. We know that it can cause not just cramps, heat exhaustion and heat stroke and heat stroke has been the cause of death for, uh, quite a few athletes far, far, far too many because they limited their water either themselves or potentially their coaches. And they need to be able to drink the water at ab libidum. So meaning that they can just do whenever they feel thirsty. In fact, whenever you feel thirsty is probably when you're already starting to become dehydrated. So the issue was that the coaches were saying, oh no, you need to need to make sure that you don't drink water or don't let the athletes drink water because you need to toughen them up. There could be maybe potentially almost sort of uh, maybe a psychological aspect to it that could potentially toughen them up. Maybe possibly. I know that sounds like a politician's answer, but that is exactly how much, maybe that much, <laughs> but the benefit, the benefit does not, does not, does not outweigh. It doesn't even come close to the negative effects that could have on not just potential health, but the performance. The performance is going to decrease. Sorry, I just had a big truck go by and made a lot of noise. Anyway, the athletes are going to decrease their performance because they have less water in their bodies. They have less blood volume. Their plasma is constantly being excreted. So they need water. They need to replenish that water. And they also need to replenish maybe some electrolytes as well at certain points in time. So having a little, little bit of Gatorade or a little bit of Powerade, something there with some sodium, maybe some chloride in it, but water, water is the key. But some of these coaches uh, over a certain period of time have simply not allowed their athletes to drink water because of some sort of I don't know, man code or something. I don't know. It's just not with guy sports, but also it, it's happened in female sports as well. But people have died from this. Now, I think the reason that that became a trend uh, somewhere is because I, I think it's one of those things that was passed down through generations, meaning the coaches said, well, my coach did it. And my coach's coach did it. My coach's coach's coach did it. So I'm going to do it. And that's how we won 15, you know, district titles in a row. All that craziness that people go into when they get all hyped up, testosterone and all this stuff about, oh man, back in my day, this is what we did. So it doesn't matter what you did back in your day. Is it safe? Is it, and is it effective? Well, we know it's not safe. And is limiting water actually effective? No, it's not. In fact, it decreases performance. Now you can get too much water and maybe start to get a little bit bloated, especially if that water is uh, mixed in with, you know, a Gatorade mix or something like that. And then it could cause maybe some uh, issues there with um, a little bit of bloating uh, because some of that, if it's too sugary, it could just stay in the stomach and they could actually vomit from that as well. But they need the water. They need to replenish the water. They need to replenish electrolytes at some point. So they need fluids. They need them. Restricting them is absolutely insane. Don't do it. If you become a coach, don't do it. I mean, you can't just be like having somebody go over and drink water constantly. But if someone's thirsty, they're already probably becoming, dehydra becoming dehydrated. So they need water. Let them get water. I mean, there should be water available. At, at, at all times, if, if somebody is in a game, uh, if you're at a small school, if somebody is, uh, maybe in a football game or soccer match or wh wherever it is for, um, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes in a row and they have no break. And then you tell them, Oh no, you can't get water. You can't come out for a player or two to get some water. That that's absolutely ridiculous. I've, I've seen it. The reason I go on these rants is because I've seen it. I've, I've seen this stuff. Thank goodness uh, that there was no negative effects on either me or my teammates or anything like that. And I, I just, I just hope that we've moved past that, that type of mentality where you need to earn your water or whatever craziness people are coming up with. But, uh, there, there's a lot of things in youth sports that hopefully we've kind of moved on from.
from that. But anyway, that's my little rant from that. I apologize for that. But anyway, that's something that I think is needed to be said, especially during a chapter like this. All right. The next topic I want to talk about is the subject of core temperature measurements. Now in class, in the lab, we actually used the pills. The pills are absolutely wonderful. They're pretty accurate. They're maybe not as accurate as a couple other ways of measuring core temperature. And I'll get into those in a second. But with those core temp pills, you really need to have those in your body probably for six to eight hours. They need to be deep in the intestines. I mean, way down in there. They need to be almost in the large intestine. If they're in the large intestine, that's probably fine too. But they need to be kind of towards the end of the small intestine. So it needs to work its way through. So roughly six to eight hours, give or take. There's been some studies on it where the best uh, time frame is uh, afterward to, um, you know, how, how long should it be in the body before you start taking the measurements? But we got pretty good measurements in the lab uh, with even some of the subjects taking it half hour, an hour beforehand. It, it gives fairly decent results. Uh, at least gives you an idea of what the core temp is doing. Anyway, the changes in it uh, increasing or decreasing. So the pills are wonderful. And plus they're pretty mobile. You can take them pretty much anywhere. As long as you have a little, little device, as long as you have the pill to swallow, take it anywhere. But the other couple ones that are more accurate are thoracic and rectal. Rectal is the most common. And I know you're probably thinking, well, thoracic sounds a lot better. <laughs> now, thoracic, let me give you an idea of what thoracic is first before uh, anyone thinks about which one they might want to do. Thoracic is you take the little device, the uh, sensor, it's flexible, and you put it up the nose, back of the nasal cavity, and swallow it, and it needs to get down in basically right behind the heart. That's where it needs to be. So that thing is in there the entire time. Go ahead and try exercising with that thing through your nose, down your throat. Some people might start thinking, well, maybe the rectal thermometers are a little bit better. Just kind of, I guess, pick your poison type of thing. The rectal thermometers, actually, I got a charging cord here for an iPhone. It is actually probably about the size of a charging cord. So it obviously doesn't have this, uh, have the ends on it, uh, but it is, um, it's about this thick uh, in diameter and it's just as flexible as, as these cords and they need to be because these are designed, the, not, not the, not these charger cords, but the, um, the rectal thermometers, the ones that we use in exercise science, they're designed to be flexible so that somebody can sit on them or have them in while they're seated, while they're on a bike, while they're on a treadmill. Again, the body is going to be in motion, so they can't be rigid. So they need to be flexible so that they can kind of move with the body. Now, what we would do, and in grad school, I know there's a social faux pas around this, but I'm telling you, it is absolutely nothing. It is nothing. It is just something that is just done. It's... um I, I, I don't know. I, I just don't know how to, how to describe it to try to, uh, I guess, get some of the things out, uh, out there. It, I mean, any guy who turns 50 at some point, you're going to have to go through probably something much worse. So we'll just put it through that way. I got, I got a few years left till I, till I get to that point. But basically what we would do if a subject would come in is you would have the cord and we would put a little piece of tape on there. It was about, I think it was like 13 or 14 centimeters is how far it needed to go in. So we would put a piece of tape and say it needs to go in that far. And we would give them a little packet of KY jelly. They would go in, they would stick it in and they would, um, we would also give them a little bit of tape, a specialized tape that uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't lose its stickiness so much with sweat and also with water, any, any type of water. And they would tape part of it to like their butt cheek as well as their lower back. That way it wasn't, pulling out too much, um, from their butt. And, uh, so that they, they could be exercising with it and, uh, everything was okay with that then. So it wasn't bad. Subjects did it. Uh, guys, girls did it. Didn't matter. 
uh, but it is the most accurate way of getting core temperature. At least as of right now, it's the most accurate way. The pills work just fine, but there is some variation. There's a little bit more variation in the reading to reading, but the, um, the rectal thermometers are definitely much, much better uh, in terms of consistency within the measurements. The thoracic is right behind the, um, the rectal temperatures. So, but again, it's kind of pick your poison type, type of thing. Do you want it in this end or that end? It just, it just kind of depends upon what, what you want to do. So anyway, that was kind of it, uh, for that, but Anyway, summing up the rest of this chapter, those are my couple little rants there. I apologize for that. But summing up this chapter a little bit here, we went into some of the health risks for the uh, heat, exercise in the heat. And uh, that's kind of why I wanted to talk about, you know, earning or water type of thing is that these are real. These happen to people. The, the heat cramps are the most common. They're the least severe. And the heat exhaustion then um, happens fairly often, not a lot, but fairly often still too much. And then the heat stroke does occur. It's fairly rare, but it does happen and people do die from it. And all of this, most of this, excuse me, most of this can be prevented by proper hydration before and also during the physical activity, not just proper hydration, but also replenishing of some of those electrolytes as well. Now, when we got into the cold exposure, um, a couple of things I want to talk about there, uh, was with the, uh, subcutaneous tissue. There was actually a study that was done by a, another grad student one, uh, actually my first year in grad school, his dissertation was on cold water immersion and he was looking at fat guys and skinny guys. I mean, really, really skinny guys and not overly fat guys, but you know, chubbier guys, I, I guess kind of like me, someone maybe a little bit heavier than me. And it was pretty obvious the, I'm, I'm trying to think what the temperature was, but I think it was right around the coldest temperature was right around 40 degrees. We're talking 40 degree cold water. The fat guys made it the entire two hours of sitting there in that water. The skinny guys, none of them made it. They could not handle it. Not only could they not handle it, they were shivering really, I mean, they were really, really shivering. The one guy, he was a trooper. We had him in as long as he, as long as we could until his core temperature dropped too low. And we said, we got to pull you because you're on the brink of hypothermia. Uh, we would pull them out and get them on a bike and do some active recovery to warm their bodies up. Uh, also, also dry them off and get some clothes on and stuff like that. But his lips started to turn a little bit blue it was a little scary to see, but, um, that's, you know, that's what we seen was the, the, the fat guys just performed better and were able to last longer in that cold water immersion than skinny guys were. So, um, again, the, uh, having a little bit of extra, extra cushion definitely helps in cold weather. Also clothing is a big factor in cold weather and also heat too. One type of clothing you want to stay away from in either heat or cold. It doesn't matter. And this is going to sound really strange, but cotton. Cotton is probably one of the worst type of clothing materials that we have. It's really cheap. In fact, when I lived in Texas, we had, I mean, vast cotton fields. And we would watch them pick it and put them in the big bales and everything. And it's it's cheap. And it's easy to make things from cotton, but it is not very good of dissipating heat and also wicking away sweat. Take a cotton t-shirt sometime and, and you probably actually experienced this. If you have a cotton t-shirt on and you're sweating, I mean, that sweat just stays there. That, that shirt stays soaked and it doesn't dissipate a lot of the heat very well. But if you have something like a polyester or maybe a wool, type of clothing on or like a merino wool it is far better it wicks away the sweat but also dries much much quicker than the cotton does in the cold temperatures same thing if you're exercising in the cold some type of polyester like a base layer or something like that is going to help dissipate some of that sweat because you don't want to be 
sweating and have that sweat stay there. And now you're in cold weather, especially cold, windy weather with sweat. That's going to, you're going to cause a major heat sink in the body. Core temperature is going to drop fairly rapidly. So you want to make sure to have something that can wick away some of the sweat. The other thing too, uh, merino wool is popular. It's actually what I use quite a bit for hunting um, because it's, it, it, merino wool has a property in which it stays fairly warm, even though it's wet. So uh, it helps wick away some of the moisture from your skin, but also helps to keep your body warm. So there's different layering properties too. And I, I could go into that quite a, quite a bit. I've kind of gone into some of uh, uh, studied at least a little bit of that studied it, meaning that I looked up some of the studies and, um, uh, also seen some of the clothing from different clothing companies, uh, from hiking companies, but also from companies like Sitka and QU and things like that. You can kind of look some of that stuff up. A lot of that is layering, um, and layering correctly to make sure that your body stays cool or stays warm, depending upon what the environment is. So wicking away sweat is the biggest factor. You need to have a good base layer on, whether you're exercising just out, uh, just kind of going for a run in a cold day or a hot day, humid day, uh, wearing the proper clothing sometimes can be a major, major factor in how your body is going to respond because you're able to wick away some of that sweat and also keep the body warm as well. So Clothing plays a huge role in thermoregulation as well. Uh, so try to stay away from cotton as, as much as you can. That's definitely um, not as good of a clothing layer as what, at least what, what we once thought. And again, it's cheap to make though. So uh, usually they're fairly cheap, but a lot of things made out of polyester now are fairly cheap. It's, it's just getting better and better. So so that was pretty much it for uh, the heat in the cold. So if you have any questions, any comments, anything like that, just let me know. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening as well. If you're listening this on a device, maybe listening on a, um, a record player or an iPad, uh, iPod. I don't know how many people have iPods anymore. I have an old one somewhere, but who knows where it is. <laughs> it's, it's somewhere underneath my desk here somewhere. But anyway, I thank you for watching and uh, thank you for listening. Y'all take care.